Well, for today's story, I'm going to take us all back to the Revolutionary War days and the men that were over the mountain and what they were doing and how they were living. They were living, and they knew it, on land that the king had said belonged to the Cherokee Indians. They didn't think too much about that, and they fought the Indians bravely to keep from getting scalped by the Indians who were being paid by King George III for every scalp that they could take. The Indians were fighting a losing battle because the settlers over there were being reinforced by new settlers that were coming across the mountain and looking for a place to live. Well, gee, even my ancestors lived over the mountain at this time. So here's the way it began to unfold. Our leaders were Isaac Shelby and John Sevier. And John Sevier had had a rough time right about now. His first wife had died, leaving him with their eight children. They were married when he was about 16, I guess, and so was she. And she died in her early 30s, leaving John Sevier still with a few youngsters around. Well, John went to Corton, and he found Bonnie Kate Sherrill. Bonnie Kate Sherrill was a member of their community, a single lady whose life he had saved uh, four years ago. What he, how that unfolded was like this. The Cherokee had attacked. They had retreated into their fort. John got up on the side of the fort, watching the Cherokee, and he saw something that frightened him. He saw Bonnie Kate Sherrill, a member, member of the community, who had not gotten the word in time, and now the fort was locked up. Nobody was anxious to open the door. The Indians were hoping someone would because they had gathered around the door, those that weren't chasing Bonnie Kate. Now, Bonnie Kate was an athletic sort of a young lady, it was said she could outride and outshoot any man in the community. And she was now being chased by the Indians. The Indians weren't real anxious to catch her. They were herding her toward the door of the fort, the gate of the fort, hoping someone would open the gate and let Bonnie Kate in. Nobody was doing that. It looked bad for Bonnie Kate. They were leaving her outside with the Indians to protect the whole clan from an open gate. But not John Sevier. He saw what was happening. He called to Bonnie Kate. She came running over to where he was, but he was up on the top of the fort and she was down there on the ground. He reached over, she jumped up. Well, history, differs on what happened next, but I'll tell you, I was an eyewitness. I saw what John did. He tried to reach her. He couldn't. He got two of his buddies. They grabbed hold of his ankles. They dangled him over the edge of the fort. He reached out, grabbed Bonnie Kate by the arm, Indians closing in. They pulled Bonnie Kate to safety inside the stockade and saved Bonnie Kate's life. Well, okay, four years later, Bonnie Kate is still unmarried. They said, and I guess I pretty much agree, that she was probably fearsome. The men might not like her too much because she could outride and outshoot them, and they might not get the obedience they were hoping for. But that didn't bother John. He was looking for someone to take care of him and the kids, and Bonnie Kate was available. So they married. Now John's a well-known partier as well as a well-known fighter. And so two weeks later, the wedding celebration was still going on. And the next day they had scheduled a horse race. 
they seemed to do that frequently on the frontier, and a lot of money was generally bet. Well, John had a horse that he liked, and so did others in the community. So they were looking forward to the horse race. But toward evening, the day before the horse race, up came <clears throat> old man Shelby. Uh, he was bearing bad news. I called him old man. He was leader of the of a, a militia, just like John was. Isaac Shelby was his name, and he wasn't really any older than John Severe. But he came in, and he broke up a little gathering at the uh, still celebrating the wedding asked John what he was doing. He said he was celebrating his wedding, and Isaac Shelby said, well, that was two weeks ago. John said, yes, but we're not through yet. He said, well, can I borrow you for a minute? We have a serious problem. He took John aside, and he explained that his cousin had been taken prisoner by Patrick Ferguson in the recent skirmish, and had been spared. He was sent back home with a message. And the message was from, she from Ferguson, you men must cease your opposition to British arms, or I'm going to march my army over the mountain. I'm going to hang your leaders, like Isaac Shelby and like John Sevier, and I'm going to burn everybody's barn and home and the survivors are going to have to come back across the Continental Divide and live where King George said for them to live. Well, both men took that as a very serious threat. Ferguson was known across the boundary and on the south and east side of the Continental Divide. He was known to be taking no prisoners. If he suspected that you were not in favor of the British, he would either try to change your mind, and if that didn't seem to work, he'd take your valuables, he'd burn your home, and if none of that did it, he'd come back and hang you and move on to the next person. It was a serious threat that he had given us across the uh, Continental Divide, settling in Indian territory as we were. So John and Isaac started talking about what would be needed. They needed an army that would be of a comparable size to Ferguson's. Ferguson's army was 1,200 men he'd raised. None of them were British. All of them were raised just like John and his friends as immigrants to this country. So. They decided, well, okay, we're going to need a big army, and maybe we can get some help from uh, Virginia. But the Virginians had been chartered by George Washington himself to defend the lead mines in Virginia, because that's where a lot of people were going to get lead, and on our side it was okay, but we didn't want the British to have access to that. Well, Isaac Shelby said, I think I can persuade those folks. And so he decided he would go off to Virginia and try to get 400 folks under uh, Cleveland's uh, uh, leadership to abandon the lead mines for a little while on the thesis that if they wiped out our organization, our militia, our people here, and we had to go live across the mountain, it wouldn't be long before they'd be after him. So he set off to do that. But in the meantime, we had figured out we we're going to need 500 pounds of gunpowder. The British didn't let us have gunpowder. They tried to block it off in every way they could. We had a recent uh, emigrant to our organization who knew how to make gunpowder. And so the gunpowder maker was charged 
with making 500 pounds of gunpowder. And she, because it was a she, Mary Patton, risked life and limb to make 500 pounds illegally of gunpowder to arm the armies that were getting together. They set the date. We're going to leave here on the 26th of September. Let's get going. After Shelby left to go get help from the Virginians, John Sevier had the problem of finding a little bit of money to pay for the supplies that were going to have to be taken by the army. The only person with money on the frontier was the tax collector for North Carolina, clear over there in what's now in Tennessee. Beam was his name, and he was a very reasonable guy. <clears throat> So John went to talk to him and said he was speaking for himself and Isaac Shelby, and we needed money to get prepared to go fight the British. And he said, well, he had $13,000, but it belonged to the state of North Carolina, and he was not able to release that. And John Sevier said, yes, you are. Uh, we will sign for it. If we are killed uh, in this battle, because it's a life or death battle that they were preparing for, if we are killed, then you won't need the money anyway because we will be overrun here and this community will disappear. But if we survive as we fully intend to, then both Isaac Shelby and John Sevier are on call for the money. Well, that sounded reasonable to the tax collector. So that's how the two militia got enough money to both pay for the gunpowder and other provisions that were going to be needed. So they met back on the 25th of September, 1780. And one of the highlights of the meeting was that many, many, many people, nearly everyone in the communities of uh, Shelby and, and Sevier had volunteered to go, go fight the British. But that would leave the frontier and those towns undefended. So what they did is they lined the men up and had them count off by seven and every seventh man was expected to step back and stay home and was cautioned to wear as many different clothes in the course of a day as he could and be as visible as possible because the Cherokee who are always on alert and always watching the settlements would not catch on right away that almost all the men had left to go fight the British. That was the scene of what in modern times would be called the first draft. And the draft was to pick a few people to stay home and not go fight. Well, two of the men that volunteered to go fight, they could have stayed home, but they didn't were named Crawford and Chambers. Crawford was the older one, I believe, and Chambers was just a young lad, maybe in his early teens, who was easily influenced. But the two of them got together and plotted a scheme. They would march with the army until the first night, and then they'd disappear in the dark and go across the mountain early and tell Ferguson, the army was coming. Those people would not be spies, they would be traitors. And in fact, that's what they did. We didn't discover the missing until a day or so later when a roll call was taken by John Sevier and he was two men short. Now they figured it out. Crawford and Chambers 
had gone across the Continental Divide and found Ferguson or tried to and told him the army was coming. That presented us with a big problem. We had about a thousand men uh, coming, but Ferguson had 1,200, and if he lay in ambush along the route we were taking, we had to be prepared to fight. Well, that was a, a, a problem that we solved in a couple of minutes when I tell you about when we got to what is now the Mineral Museum in little Switzerland on the Blue Ridge Parkway. <laughs>